All right. Um, so I um, I posted the third problem set. And um, and I posted some links for you to be able to submit the rough drafts of your projects, which I think are due Tuesday. Uh, so the problem set is due at noon um, on the the last Tuesday of classes, and then the final the the final draft of the project is due. The rough draft and the final draft are due at midnight on Tuesday, this Tuesday, and um, the last day of classes, which is Thursday, April seventh. Okay. Uh, any questions? Other questions? So we were harvesting, we were in the process of harvesting consequences of the Bishop Gromov theorem uh, last class. And uh, so the other main consequence, so I mentioned doubling, but doubling is almost immediate from the theorem because the theorem says, how does the psi, how does the measure of a larger ball relate to the measure of a smaller ball? It says the measure of the larger ball is controlled by the measure of the smaller ball. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to get out of it is that um, when the, when you have these curvature dimension conditions with finite dimension, that that implies uh, um, the heine borel property for the space, which, or that the space is boundedly compact. So in other words, all closed bounded sets become compact. And so there's a very useful characterization. Um, so, and then what I'm going to do for the next few weeks is um, we're going to be talking about convergence of measure spaces. And uh, so one of the sources that I'm drawing from the, on that from that is the book by Barago, Barago and Ivanov, uh, which I will abbreviate to BBI. Barago squared and Ivanov. <laughs> um, so one, so there's a nice a, a nice metric. Uh, so a nice ca characterization of compactness for metric spaces. So BBI lemma. I don't know what it is, 1.65, I think. Um, yes, yes. It says that um, a metric space Oh, yes, gosh. Um, so there's a bit of notation, so I should define it first. So the definition is that um, MD is totally bounded. If and only if, um, for every positive epsilon or positive r, um, there exists a number n r less than infinity, such that um, oh sorry, I should have said m is totally bounded if and if it's complete. And oh, sorry, I'm, I'm getting I'm getting myself all mixed up. <laughs> sorry, the um, it's totally bounded if and only if there for every small radius there's an n such that um, there exists a cover or let's say an R net an R net. X one with at most n r elements and what it means to be an r net is that uh, m is covered by those guys. Sorry, I'm I don't know where I my head is today. Um, Um, and then this characterization is that a metric space is compact I guess a metric space MD is compact if and only if M is complete and totally bounded. And uh, uh, one of uh, maybe some of you've seen this before. I don't know if all of you've seen it before or not. But um, so one of the directions is pretty clear. So 
Um, if it's compact, then you cover it by balls of radius r, and you can uh, you, you can always find a subcover uh, with finitely many elements. And so um, the converse is that, um, so, and the converse basically uses. Uh, so by the way, how many people have seen this before? Oh, almost everyone has seen it. Everyone that I can see has seen it. So the converse basically uses a diagonal argument. You know, you cover it by finitely models of radius k. Uh, you want to show to show it's one way to show it's compact is in a metric space is to show that every sequence has a convergent subsequence. So you cover it by balls by finitely many balls of radius one over k, and you know infinitely many of the elements of any given sequence will be in one of those balls. And then you choose a smaller radius, and again there'll be infinitely many elements in that one of those balls by the pigeonhole principle. And um, by doing a diagonal uh, extraction of subs, you can get the thing to converge. Okay. And so that's that's this is a cheap way to show that um, this this little lemma, whatever Biaga Biaga Ivanov one point six five, gives us an easy way to show that um, a CD can space. So now here's the corollary. So the corollary of the both of the above lemma and of the Bishop Gromov inequality is that um, if MDM is CDKN with n finite, so K and R and n less than infinity, then um, MD is boundedly is boundedly compact. I'm adopting uh, i.e. every closed bounded set is compact. So it, it doesn't depend on the measure. So if it's CDKN for any measure, then it's boundedly compact. That's right. OK, thank you. Um, right, because the notion of, of every closed set being compact doesn't depend on the measure. And um, so let's see, let me try to sketch a proof. So the proof starts out the same way the proof that it uh, we could control the Hausdorff dimension by capital N started. Um, so recall for all small and large radiuses and a pair of points X naught and Z in M, um, Bishop Gromov, the Bishop Gromov inequality says that the mass of the ball with the small radius controls the mass of the ball with the larger radius um, with the appropriate integrals in the denominator. So this is like an integral from zero to R of um, whatever the S K over N t to the power n dt over t. Yeah, I, I was doing that last class as well. Um, and we argued that um, that if, sorry, if, if um, this is for, hang on, this is actually not what I want. So if the small, the small ball is contained in the ball around z of radius r, then that means the ball around Z of radius R is contained in a ball around X naught of radius two R. I think this is what I want. So, um, so let's make this um, X naught two R same integral, and uh, but because of this containment, I can relate it to the ball around Z of radius R. Great. And now what, uh, so, so I wanna fix BZR and show 
all um, closed subsets of C in BZR are compact. That's what I'm asked to prove. And um, So by the by the pre so we already um, our our metric spaces our our CD canon spaces are always polished so they're always complete, and so by the previous lemma, it's enough if I can show M is uh, totally bounded. Sorry. By completeness. Enough to show. Sorry, rather this ball BZR is totally bounded. But, um, and then it's sort of the same argument that we did last class. So take uh, a map given, given R bigger than zero and less than capital R. Um, take a maximal disjoint collection of balls B X I of radius R inside B Z R. And then Uh, because the because the sum of the masses of the BXI, because they're disjoint, the sum of the measures of the BXI has to be dominated by the measure of BZR because they're contained. And on the other hand, this Bishop Grump, the um, the this inequality here. Um, gives us a lower bound on these guy on these masses, and um, so the question is, how many of these balls can there be, right? And uh, so this is at least um, J times M B I R, uh, but so J has to be the number has to be less than MBZ, MZR over MBXIR. And what we read off from the inequality above is that that ratio is less than the integral up to 2R divided by the integral up to R of the same expression. Um, the SK over N T to the nth power DT over T. Yeah. And since that's finite and it doesn't depend on little x i, it only depends on, you know, this this is some constant depending on capital R and little r and maybe z. Um, it's that just basically says it's totally, oh yes, right. So that says there's finite, there's I have a, a uniform bound on this number j. So this is if you like my n r in the definition of total boundedness. And then the point is that the whole of bzr is contained in the union if I double the sizes of these sets. So um, because of the maximality, if, 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 the, if I didn't have containment here, I'd be able to find another one of these balls of radius R that was disjoint from all the other guys. And um, so, okay, so this is, this is, I guess, N of, Maybe two R. Is it clear? No. Okay, great. Wonderful. Okay, so then, um, so as I was saying, then that there's sort of two directions we can go, but I think the um, so the, the one direction we can go, which I think I'm going to postpone until next week, is. Um, 
so we now know these spaces are fairly nice, these CD, CD epsilon KN spaces, um, at least for N finite. And one direction that I want to go probably starting next week is to show, um, I, I sort of claimed that these spaces were, uh, have the same relation to Ramanian manifolds with Ricci lower bounds on their curvature and of K times N minus one and dimensional bound, on bounds, capital N on upper bounds on their dimension, um, that they have the same relation to rational, to manifolds that the real numbers have the rational numbers. So in some sense that these, maybe maybe not that this is the completion of, the, of all Ramanian manifolds with those Cur lower curvature bounds and upper dimensional bounds, but that the completion of all Ramanian manifolds lies in this space. But in order to talk about completion, we need to talk about metrics. We need to talk about convergence of metric spaces. And uh, I do want to do that. And um, I probably will start doing that next week. And uh, so, th and there's a sequence of ideas that maybe I can just, I can just say some of the words in case uh, you want to. So, um, so first of all, um, for subsets, there's the Hausdorff metric. on subsets um, of a given metric space. And the idea would be that um, the, dis the Hausdorff metric distance between K and L is basically the smallest R such that K lives in an R neighborhood of L and L lives in our neighborhood of K. And um, where, where, um, where by K R, what I mean is it's the union overall little K and capital K. Sorry, uh, K is perhaps not the best notation here, but uh, I guess it'll suffice for now. Um, uh, it's the union of balls of, radius x of radius r around x. And although the although dh dh is actually a semi-metric, so dh takes subsets of m into zero infinity. And so what it means to be a semi-metric is that um, i.e. Um, dh of ab is dh of ba and it satisfies the triangle inequality and um, for all a b and c which are subsets of M and it's non-negative. With equality if B equals A, but maybe not if and only if. So that's what it means to be a semi-metric. If this was if and only if it would be a metric distance. And whenever you have a semi-metric, so for example, um, dh of a and its closure are gonna be zero, even if a is not closed. And so whenever you have a semi-metric, you can convert it to a metric. Um, this is another little lemma of Burago, Burago and Ivanov. Um, one point uh, one five. Um, if, if D is a semi-metric, on some space, um, then basically you can define equivalence classes of sets that have zero distance. Then um, the quotient space
um, becomes a metric space. So in other words, the projection of D onto the quotient space is well-defined. And so basically um, the Hausdorff distance, so a corollary of this is that DH is a metric on closed sets. And maybe I'll call the closed sets CM of M. Oh, so that's great. Um, but so far, we're always comparing um, subsets of a single space, uh, which is, and what we really want to compare are subsets, are different metric spaces to each other. And so one of uh, uh, one of Gromov's ideas was um, to compare, uh, let's say, M one D one to M two D two. Then we would look at um, look at all isometric embeddings of M one D two and M two D two into third spaces, arbitrary third spaces. And so, um, so if you embed these things isometrically into some third space, then you can talk about the um, the Gromov Hausdorff between a distance between the embedding of M one into M and the embedding of M two into M, and you would define the the Gromov Hausdorff distance between M one D one and M two D two would be the infimum of the Hausdorff distance. So let me call, maybe I'll call the isometric embeddings I1 and I2. Um, so the Hausdorff distance between the isometric image of M1 and the isometric image of M2, where the infimum is taken over all MD and isometric embeddings. Right. Um, by isometric embedding, I just mean distance preserving, a bijection here. Uh, um, I taking M1 to M2 is an isometry. If and only if um, the D2 distance between Ix and Ix prime is equal to the D1 distance between X and X prime for all X and X prime in M1. And it's an iso uh, and uh, And so by isometric embedding, what I mean that I don't mean that I have a bijection between M1 and M, but rather I have a bijection between M1 and the range of I1 in M, uh, and that I, I1 acts as an isometry between M1 and its, its image. So there's this kind of, you know, this kind of wild idea of Gromov, which is to look at all isometric embeddings into larger metric spaces and then take an infimum over that. And that uh, that's a semi-metric on metric spaces. Let's say on compact metric spaces, maybe even metric spaces, but um, 
so other issues come into play, which we'll talk about in, presently when we want to deal with non-compact spaces. But so it's a semi-metric on compact metric spaces. And uh, you can do the quotient construction. And the quotient construction Basically, um, two spaces will have zero distance in this Gromov Hausdorff sense if they're isometric to each other. So maybe I should have remarked that. Remark um, DGH M1, M2 is zero um, if M1 and M2 are isometric. And I think this becomes if and only if, if they're also compact. And so the, the quotient construction above gives a metric distance on isometry classes of compact metric spaces. And so a, a target theorem that I am going to talk about eventually is that um, oh, I still am not quite there yet. Hmm. Um, so I want to say something like, um, yeah, I, I need more. Um, I want to say something like CDKN. So let me call this a meta theorem because I'm not quite there. Meta theorem um, for every K and R and N less than infinity. Um, CDKN is pre compact. And the reason I'm not quite there yet is that um, we've only, these spaces, these CD CAN spaces, um, maybe this is, so I guess this would probably becomes a theorem if, um, if we take K to be positive. Because then the whole spaces actually are compact. Uh, if we wanted a version of this theorem for K negative, we need to talk about how to measure the distance between non-compact spaces. And that's a little bit more subtle because of examples like this. So imagine a cylinder. which is shaped like a wine bottle, and, but which extends to infinity in both directions. Um, so somehow if I, if I take a, a limit of this cylinder sliding it to the right, it's gonna, if this wine bottle, it's gonna converge to a large cylinder. And if I take a limit of this cylinder sliding it to the left, it's gonna converge to a small cylinder. And if I take a limit of this, this wine bottle sitting still, it's gonna converge to itself. And so in order to deal with non-convex spaces, I need to worry about this and have a better notion of convergence. But once I have this better notion of convergence, it's called pointed gromov hausdorff distance or pointed gromov hausdorff convergence. Once I have this, um, this better notion of convergence, uh, which allows me to deal with non-convex spaces, then this theorem works for K negative as well as K positive. Um, so that's a nice thing. Uh, what basically that says, what pre-compact means is that um, whenever, I have a, whenever I have a sequence of these CDKN spaces, I can always find a Cauchy subsequence, Cauchy with respect to this metric. And then you can wonder what the limit is. And um, of course the limit will be a metric space, but um, 
and you'd like to know in order in order for this to be a compactness result and not just a pre-compactness result, um, you'd need the limit to be a CDKN space as well. And in order to make sense of that limit, to, in order to even make sense of whether the limit is CDKN or not, you need a measure. And so you also need to modify this notion of convergence to take into account the measures. So once you modify this notion of gromov hausdorff convergence to take into account the measures, you get that um, you get that these spaces are, are actually compact. And so in that sense, uh, in that, you, well, you can prove it's some work to show, but you can prove that these, this collection of metric spaces is actually compact. And in that sense, it's kind of like a completion. It contains a completion of Ramanian manifolds with lower reach curvature bounds K and upper dimension bounds N. So somehow that's the goal for the next few weeks. Um, but, and I wanted to kind of expose you to the ideas uh, partly so you can get used to them, partly in case you wanna read up on them in Burago, Burago and Ivanov or somewhere else. So, um, but actually this, the pre-compactness of this set of spaces is actually closely follows um, the ideas we use to show that this, this kind of argument, the total boundedness argument, it closely follows this total boundedness and completeness idea that we use to show that, um, that these sets here as individual sets, not as sequences of measure spaces are actually boundedly compact. So that's kind of a, what do you call it, a foreshadowing. Uh, so before I do that, I should, thought I should give you some more examples of these metric measure spaces. And so, so, so the so of course so let, let me remind you of the picture. The picture is in order to satisfy. Um, let me think about Rn. So if I'm in Rn with the Euclidean distance, um, then if I take in order. Uh, so I still have some choice of reference measure, right? So I, I could take the Euclidean volume but I could also put some factor in front of it that depends on what point I'm at. And so like I could look at Gauss Gauss measure on Euclidean space instead of instead of Euclidean volume. And um, if I look at Gauss measure, that'd be taking phi to be a parabola. Um, and then I take two to satisfy, what does it mean to satisfy CDKN? It means that whenever I take a measure mu naught here and a measure mu one there, and I look at the Wasserstein geodesic joining them, then at the midpoint, so I have some profile here and some profile here, I get some profile at the midpoint. So this is in CDKN, if and only if, um, our entropy um, S of mu relative to, let me call this M, S of mu relative to M is D2, or let's say is K D2 squared mu naught mu one N convex along some D2 geodesic joining each uh, mu naught and mu one with finite second moments. And so we're here S of mu M is basically the integral of the log of uh, d mu dm with respect to mu if uh, mu is absolutely continuous and it's plus infinity else with some convention about what happens in case this doesn't converge absolutely. But I don't need to worry about those conventions if, if the measure on the whole space is finite. And so you can see that uh, when I put th this question of whether or not this thing is convex or KN, KN convex is going to depend on what reference measure I'm using here. Right, the reference measure only enters in one place. 
And so if, if I change this Euclidean volume by multiplying it by some conformal factor, e to the minus phi, I'm going to change those. Uh, I may change the question of whether or not this thing satisfies the KN convexity condition. And so I'd like to see for which phi's uh, this thing here will be KN convex. And here's. Let me see if I can give some intuition. Um, so what's the intuition? Uh, I guess the intuition is that um, if you think about taking, if I do think about um, transport across the middle of the Gaussian, um, the reference measure in the Gaussian case is much larger in the middle than it was in the Euclidean volume case. And so as a re result, this ratio is going to be much smaller in the middle than it was in the Euclidean volume case. And so, um, so my S is going to be more convex than it was with respect to Euclidean volume. So I should get, I sh so with when M is Euclidean volume, I know this KN convexity holds with K equals zero and capital N equals little n. And I should expect if I put a Gauss measure instead of Euclidean volume, this should hold for uh, maybe uh, larger values of K, K strictly larger than zero. And so here is the theorem that I'd like to prove today. Um, great. Um, so let me call it Euclidean CD CAN spaces. And of course, there's an analogous theorem for Ramanian manifolds, but the Euclidean version is easier. And so those of you who uh, know the Ramanian geometry well can try to translate this into the Ramanian world. Um, so I'm going to look. I'm going to restrict my attention to smooth, um, smooth enough uh, potentials phi. And um, maybe I should take maybe 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 uh, maybe better um, where M uh, is a bounded subset. Or a compact subset. And then I don't have to worry about moments. Although, so that's just a simplifying. I mean, the, the theorem is true without assuming compactness of M, but to simplify the proof, I let me assume M is compact. Um, and so I'm, let me before that recall that uh, Rn with its Euclidean metric and volume belong to. Uh, CD zero n, and so, so also to all smaller values of k and larger values of n. And um, I'm going to set my reference measure to be as before. And then I claim that um, so if this then um, MDM satisfies my CDKN condition provided if capital N is bigger than little n and either of two things happens. Um, when, when equality holds, I need phi to be constant. So this is what we've already checked. We know how to prove that. And I claim it also holds when capital N is bigger than uh, N. And um, the Hessian of phi at X 
minus minus the rank one matrix given by a gradient of phi cross itself at x minus k times the identity matrix is positive definite. Or at least non-negative. So positive semi-definite. For every x. And um, so we're, we're going to prove the forward direction, which is the harder direction. And actually, this is if and only if. And I, I um, so this is actually if and only if. But I've left the uh, the. I've left. Uh, we'll show. The forward direction, and uh, the the reverse direction is one of the homework problems. Actually, I think I have the arrows backwards. Uh, we'll show that if one of these two conditions holds, then um, then this is here. And what uh, what you'll check on the homework is that if if both of these conditions are violated, then then this fails too. Okay, so let me start with a um, the I'm going to start with a slightly heuristic proof and then make the heuristic rigorous. So um, so here's the heuristic. Um, so my capital S, which is mu log m. I'd like to relate that to, um, so, so what do I know? I know that d mu dm is like d mu d volume, d volume dm. And um, d volume dm is probably like e to the phi. So this is like log of d mu d volume plus uh, phi. And I prefer having the, the Euclidean volume here instead of this other reference measure m because um, Recall that whenever I have two absolutely continuous probability measures on Rn, um, the D2 geodesic joining them by a unique G2 geodesic. And um, mu t also in the absolutely continuous measures on Rn. And I have a nice formula relating, uh, so mu t is the push forward of mu naught through some mapping g, where g of x tx is a gradient of a convex function. I'll call the con convex function capital U. And sometimes it's better. Oh, sorry, it's it's um sorry, it's one minus t identity plus t gradient capital U. And I'm gonna also write this in the form x plus t gradient little u. Where um, so capital U is convex, and therefore a little u which is basically capital U minus one half X squared satisfies um, little U is bigger than minus the identity matrix. So we have this nice characterization of the geodesics and we even have a Mongem pair type equation which says um, that the density of that guy, that this guy's absolutely continuous and its density at GT is given by the density of mu naught at X ratio uh, the determinant of the Jacobian derivative of gt at x. 
and that holds for mu naught almost all x. So, um, so I want to use this kind of mon pair equation to evaluate s at mu t. So let me call um, I called it little little e in my notes. So little e in my notes is going to be s mu t relative to m. And that, uh, according to the above, is integral m log, uh, let me call it rho t. So this is, this is rho t at gt, log of rho t at gt of x. Uh, sorry, it's log of rho t at y plus phi at y integrated against mu t of y. And then I want to change variables using the area formula and recalling that, uh, that the map G is countably Lipschitz. So this is the integral over M, or I can, oh, I can just, I don't even need the area formula yet. I just need that GT is the push forward of mu T. So mu T is, I just need this. I'm going to need the area formula in the moment, but I don't need it yet. So this is log of rho t gt plus phi of gt. And um, d mu zero of x. That's because mu t is the push forward of mu naught. And so I get the, I can put by composing the integrand with gt. I'm in good shape. And, um, So I haven't used the area formula. Maybe I don't need it. Uh, so I, I definitely need this Mongen pair formula. So I'm going to substitute from that. And I'm substituting under the logarithm. So the log of rho naught integrated against mu naught is just going to give me E at zero. And uh, what's left over is integral phi of gt of x minus log of determinant of dgt of x. Great. I didn't need the area formula. Huh. Um, and so now the question is whether this function of t is a can convex function or not of t. And so to determine whether et is a can convex function, I want to be able to differentiate it twice with respect to t. So I need, uh, I need e prime of t and e double prime of t. And uh, one thing to notice is that uh, g is very smooth in t. g is, in fact, linear in t. And so I shouldn't have too much trouble differentiating this. And, but in order to differentiate it, um, uh, I need to remember how to differentiate the log, log, logarithm of determinant. And so I need to recall that um, log debt of d g of x, if I take a time derivative, um, I basically get, uh, so the determinant's a product of guys. Um, and if you, and, the logarithm separates those guys. And so, um, so if you, um, so it's take, like taking the logarithm of each element and summing them. So the uh, derivative of log of determinant is like the trace of the derivative of the log. And, um, and the log uh, puts the thing under it in the denominator. And so what you get in the end is trace of dgt inverse of x. Uh, let me not write the x because it'll be too much notation. dg prime. And if I try to differentiate again, then uh, I just apply the 
I apply the product rule, but if I, if I hit this, so G was linear in T. And so one derivative of it becomes constant in T. If I hit it with another derivative, I get zero. And so when I take a second derivative here, I'm going to have trace. Uh, I only have to differentiate this term with respect to T. I'm going to get something on minus trace dgt to the minus two um, and times dg prime squared. And actually, if you if you do it in detail, you find that it's sorry, it's minus one all of this squared. Good. And when you have dg prime, is that just dg t prime, or is it like yeah, it's derivative with respect to t. Okay, so, but is it like G or G T? What do you mean G T? So oh. yeah, yeah, there's a sub so okay. so the so um there's a T there's a subscript T which I'm now suppressing. There's oh, a subscript okay. Okay. Here, but I've been suppressing it. Okay, thanks for the question. Um so now my E prime that I get by differentiating this is going to be um the integral over my bounded subset of Euclidean space, um, I'm going to have d phi evaluated at gt, um, and then the derivative with respect to t of g we just said is du d little u, um, and then I'm going to have minus this trace minus this trace up here. And I'll continue to drop the uh, subscript t on the g. So it's going to be integral of this against mu naught. And when I take a second derivative, um, there's only one t dependence here. So I'm going to get sort of the Hessian of d2 phi evaluated at gt. Um, du evaluated at x uh, and minus this thing here, which becomes plus. And all of that in gets integrated with respect to mu naught. And now, um, so the clever, there's a, a, a nice trick is that, you know, when you're looking along some geodesic and you want to differentiate with respect to t here, that's equivalent to looking along a shorter geodesic and differentiating with respect to t at zero, because these geodesics are affine reparameterizations of each other. And so I want to show, um, to show um, E double prime of t is dominates E prime of t squared over k over rather n minus k it's enough to check k, let me say d squared, where d is the distance between the endpoints of the geodesic. It's enough to check at t equals 0. And t equals 0 is a bit nice, where uh, g0 is the identity map. And so uh, dg0 is the identity matrix. Um, now, of course, g prime zero is du of x. And so d g prime at time zero is the Hessian of u at x, which we know is bigger than minus the identity matrix. So these formulas simplify at time zero. And I said this is a little bit of a heuristic proof. So the heuristic part is justifying that I've really computed the derivative correctly. So we're going to come back and justify that in the end. But um, with postponing a rigorous justification that I've computed the derivatives correctly, um, I get that uh, e prime at 0 is just the inner product of phi with u minus, uh, minus what? Um, a trace of the Hessian, trace of this Hessian is Laplacian of U. And E double prime at zero is D 
the integral of, sorry, du Hessian of phi du. Um, and this term here is trace of the Hessian squared. And now the claim, the cl first of all, we'd like to see that the, we'd like to see that this is convex. We'd like to see the integrand is positive. Um, and so the thing to notice is that a, the Hessian squared, even though the Hessian, we only, we don't know that the Hessian is positive. It's only bigger than minus the identity, but you square it, it's a symmetric matrix. You get something positive. So this term is positive. And so if, if phi is actually convex, then the whole thing would be positive. If phi is not convex, the whole thing may not be positive. So that I may have CDKN, but for some ne negative K. But in the case of a Gaussian, you'd have this Hessian would be something like the identity matrix. And so the positivity coming here would get enhanced by this term over here. Is that part clear? Everything clear so far? OK, so um, right. So to check K and N convexity, um, of course, the case phi equals constant we've done before, but let's let's redo it. So when phi is constant, these two terms dis disappear. And, uh, oh yes, we've, we've checked that, um, we've checked E double prime is positive before. What we ha maybe haven't checked is that, um, so I, I'm, I was wrong up here when I claimed uh, before the starting the proof, um, I claimed that we already knew something and it was a little less than we actually knew. I said, we know that with the Euclidean volume, it's CD whatever. What we really know is that it's CD infinity. And what I'm about to check is I can replace this infinity here. So in other words, the, we know the, the second derivative of E is positive, Never mind anything about the first derivative. What I'm gonna now check is that I can replace this infinity by N. Um, So I'd like to check, I claim that um, E double prime zero is not only non-negative, but it's actually bigger than one over N uh, E prime zero squared. And why would that be? Well, um, so E prime zero squared by the Jensen's inequality, uh, in this case, there's no first term to worry about. Um, but so an, and this is a probability measure. So an average squared is always less than square than the average of the square. And so by Jensen, this is less than Laplacian squared d u naught. And so I'd like to say that Laplacian squared is controlled by trace of the Hessian squared. And uh, so for ma matrices, there's um, the trace of a matrix A times B is always less than the trace of A times A adjoint times the trace of B times B adjoint. This is the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. For the uh, Hilbert-Schmidt norm, for the matrix norm. Sometimes called the Hilbert-Schmidt norm. And so if I apply this to the case where um, A is the identity matrix and B is the Hessian of U, what I get is the trace of the Hessian is less than the square root of the trace of the identity matrix is the dimension and the trace of the Hessian squared. And this is better known as the Laplacian. So if I square it, I get what's under here. So I get that this is less than um, n times integral trace of the Hessian squared d u naught, and we just so that's n uh, that's uh, n e double prime. So as desired. So we just check this. Okay. And it's very important that um, 
So it's very important that this matrix is symmetric because otherwise what I'd have under here is not the trace, if, if this was not a symmetric matrix, so that's where we're using that it's a gradient, the map is a gradient. If B was not a symmetric matrix, I don't have under here trace of B, the adjoint, I have trace, trace of B squared and I would be in trouble. And so now if phi is not constant, um, we want to try to do a similar thing, but it's a little bit more delicate to estimate. So I need to estimate, I still need to estimate the square of E naught from above. And I can still use um, Jensen's inequality to bring the square inside, but then I need to expand the square. So, so E naught prime squared, again by Jensen, is now going to be the square of, I guess it was du d phi minus Laplace squared d u naught. And so that's by uh, completing the square, I can always estimate that as, um, yeah, and I want it as for some reason in my notes, I put the one over n that I want later here. So let me write it. Um, I can always estimate the square inside as the square of the first term plus the square of the last term plus a little bit more of the square of the last term and a lot more of the square of the first term. So I always have an inequality like this, provided I compensate it with something like this. And we just saw that the square of the Laplacian was less than the dimension um, And all of this is integrated against mu naught. But actually, you know, I'm proving in, I'm pro the inequalities I'm proving are all inequalities for the integrand. And the, then I just integrate against the positive measure. Okay, so, um, and I know that I have, so I know that I can, I know that I have a chance to control this uh, by E double prime as long as the coefficient in front of it is one. And so I want to choose epsilon to make the coefficient in front of this one. So, choosing epsilon, choosing one plus epsilon to be the ratio of capital N over N makes the, co when I multiply this N through, it's gonna make the coefficient in front of this one. And um, it's going to, what's epsilon inverse gonna be? So epsilon is capital N minus little n over N. So epsilon inverse, so one plus epsilon inverse is gonna be, um, n over n minus n plus n minus n over n minus n, which is going to be uh, capital N over n minus n. So with this choice of epsilon, this becomes integral of one over n minus n. Uh, maybe a better way to write this is du d phi tensor d phi du. And then this becomes trace with a coefficient one in front of it of d2u squared. And this was less than E double prime. So if, if we make this assumption that, um, Sorry, uh, something's gone wrong. Oh yes, right. So E double prime, I, I talked a little bit about what E prime looked like, but E double prime has this term in it, but it also has this Hessian of phi sandwiched between grad U and grad U. <coughs> so, and my assumption now, if I come all the way back to the statement of the theorem, was that this Hessian dominates this product divided by this factor, which we've seen come up in E naught prime squared over N and dominates K. So under this hypothesis, I get that this is less than E double prime at zero minus the factor that I threw away involving K. And the K should be sandwiched between grad U and grad U. And so that's integral m grad u squared. 
And then the final thing to recall is that um, the d2 distance squared between u1 and u0 is basically the integral of, let's say, g1 of x minus x squared in u0 of x. And so, um, and g1 is x plus du, so this is integral grad u squared in u0 of x. And so this, this term here is exactly what we want it to be. And so I've just checked the kn convexity of little e. So this is the end of the heuristic proof. Other questions? And as I said, the only, the, the only thing heuristic about this proof is that I can really take these derivatives under the integral. So that in other words, that I really got the correct formula for this guy here. And so let me try to justify that formula. Um, okay, so so let's see. I want to think, so uh, recall those of you that have studied partial differential equations, um, recall that you can find a function g of st with the property that um, if I take two derivatives with respect to that either variable, let's say, um, I don't know, let's say with respect to the s variable, um, you get a delta function sitting at t. So here s and t are going to be in, let's say, the unit interval. And moreover, this is how you solve Poisson's equation on the unit interval, which is basically how you integrate twice. And moreover, you can even choose g. If you want to find solutions to Poisson's equation on the unit interval, which have zero boundary conditions, um, you uh, you can ask for this thing to vanish at, um, at when either s or t is zero. And that's called the Green's function. So it's called the the Green's function function for the Dirichlet Laplace and on the unit interval. And those of you who haven't studied uh, PDE um, can verify in a more pedantic way that uh, there's a nice explicit formula for G of ST. It's just um, something like the min of S and T. And then I need to subtract the product of ST to make it, to make it satisfy these boundary conditions. And you can kind of, this, so this, uh, because the S and T are both between zero and one, the min is always going to be bigger than the product. So this is, so in fact, um, I think I've, I think I've done it with this sign. Um, and you can kind of picture this function on the unit square. It's zero at all the boundaries and it's smooth away from the diagonal and it's linear on either side of the diagonal. And it's, I think it's, it's, it's zero at both ends of the diagonal. So I think it's like a parabola along the diagonal. And um, if you, you can see its slope is discontinuous when you cross the diagonal. And so when you take the second derivative, you get this delta function here. And so whenever you have a smooth function f on the unit interval, you have a formula like um, that relates f to the integral of its second derivative against g. So because of this minus sign, it's something like uh, minus f of t is going to be the integral 0, 1 of g s t f double prime of, let's say, s the s. 
And uh, because of the zero boundary conditions of G, you need to add or subtract an affine function to the left to make the left-hand side vanish at zero and one. And so the only affine function that will do that is one minus TF of zero plus TF of one. So you can easily check this. This is a first year calculus exercise. And what's a slightly more sophisticated exercise is that this also holds true when F is not so smooth. Or semi-convex. And then, then the only difference is that you have to interpret this as the, the um, you have to interpret this in the correct way. I don't know. I'm hedging now on whether it's the distributional second derivative or the Alexandrov second derivative. It's a measure, I guess. I guess it better be the distributional one. And so basically what I claim is that my formula for E double prime holds in the same sense um, and uh, and basically I get it by using this so I know already that um I know that um e is semiconvex and uh so I can apply this kind of formula here. So let me let me think this through once more. Um, so I, in fact, first I'm going to apply it to the integrand. Let's say continuous and convex. So apply first to integrand. E of x t which is something like phi of gt of x plus log rho, that's a constant we don't care about, minus the log determinant. So you get that, um, you get that one minus t f naught, uh, rather e of x naught plus t e of x one, minus e of xt is given by some integral. Basically the integral um, with respect to gst of the stuff we computed before. And now for most, for almost every x, our computation is justified because this, the right-hand side was, g was linear in t. So um, the stuff we computed above And now you integrate with respect to mu naught. Sorry, um, I guess I called it S, not easy, little e zero. And by Fubini's theorem, I can bring the integral inside. Uh, right. That's Fubini. And then I can apply this, this formula again. now to the integral. And since I have this formula with G here, that means that indeed I can identify the stuff that I wrote above as the distributional second derivative. And then somehow that's the justification. Um, 
and uh, and actually the stuff above is let's go back to the stuff above. No. Right. Um, so we, by the lower estimates we did for the integrand, um, we can basically show that the um, we can show the semi. I'm so. So what I'm hedging on is that. Um, We have this lower estimate for this. This stuff after we integrate is less is bigger than k d two whatever squared of u naught mu one. So I think I think that um. So what I'm hedging on is that I don't think I really know that E is semi-convex, so I can't really apply this formula to E, but I can certainly integrate this expression and I get something like this and, um, and maybe use that as the definition of the E. And there's one more, um, one more teeny issue, um, but it's simple to resolve, which is that, um, I mean, maybe you, it's like you're, when you integrate their constants of integration, so maybe you don't, um, you integrate this thing twice, you see that what you get is semi-convex, and then you check the constant, of in, you, you adopt constant of integration, which give you these two, uh, these two terms here. But you can actually do a little more from these formulas. Um, so once you have these formulas, um, you can do Lebesgue dominated convergence theorem and explore how smooth is um, so this, this thing, integrating this thing gives you a formula for E double prime of T. And if you integrate it once, you get a formula for E prime of T, which is what we had above up to a constant of integration that you have to select. And um, you can actually, from the, from the smoothness of the integrand with respect to T, you can, using the dominated convergence theorem, infer that E is actually C1 on the interior and maybe something like that the second derivative of lower semi-continuous. So this is Lebesgue dominance convergence theorem. This is uh, Fatou's lemma. And it's basically, again, the, the argument is that the stuff has a bound from below. And so I can apply Fatou to take, um, if I want to take a limit TK going to T naught. Um, I can apply phi two to know that the limit at TK of the second expression for the second derivative is no bigger than what it was at T naught. And similarly for the first derivative, except things are smoother if we go back and see what the first derivative looked like. Um, here's the first derivative. Uh, so U is convex, so I know these directional derivatives exist. This is C1, so that's pretty nice. Uh, I don't see it quite for this term right now, but but I'm sure it's true. Um, okay. So sorry, even my my I guess my rigorous proof was a little impressionistic, but so I apologize for that. But are there any questions? So if not, I will stop the recording.